What's up motivators? Today in this video slash podcast, I wanna talk about five times I completely smashed what I thought my limitations were and how I did it. Now, this isn't to talk about how good I am or how awesome my accomplishments were. More than anything, what I wanna get across is the tremendously average level of performance that in a lot of things I started with and where I was able to get by implementing a system of improvement. And that's what I think is missing in a lot of fitness motivation that people put out there. Like they talk a lot about, well, just do it, accomplish your goals. And they think that they are helping people by just getting them motivated and saying, well, wherever you are right now, you can get to where you want to be and set big, crazy, unbelievable goals. But without the system of getting from that starting point to the unbelievable goal, you're kind of sending people on a wild goose chase. Now, I really do believe that people can and should set those unbelievably crazy goals that really get you excited and fulfilled, maybe even a little bit scared. But at the same time, I think that people need to have the system for how do they actually get there. And I'm going to explain why I feel that that is so important because without that system, the goals are essentially meaningless. So let's dive into it. My name is Taryn Gazelle. In my late 20s, I was overweight, unfulfilled, and couldn't even run to the end of the block. Over the following 10 years, I lost 65 pounds racing triathlons, running races, cycling events, and world championships. But eventually, the suffer culture of endurance sports training caught up to me causing health issues and injuries. Now, my company Motive and I are on a mission to help people live more fulfilling lives by reaching endurance sports goals using healthy methods. We can all kill it on race day without killing our bodies. Let's do it. Before we get into these five stories, I wanna say that if you are watching this video, excellent. You're gonna get a little bit of a bonus from some of the visuals that we'll share. But if you wanna do this as a secondary task, by all means, go to the Terran's Motive Method podcast. This episode in particular is going to be one that is particularly easy for you to listen to without the visuals. If you're listening to this in the podcast and you do want some of the visuals and a little bit of the one-on-one -on -one interaction that viewers get, you can go over to the Terran's Motive Method YouTube channel. If you are a YouTube watcher and you want to get this information early when we co-post something on YouTube and the podcast, we do always post the podcast version first. So if you're a YouTube subscriber and you want to get it earlier, go over to the Terran's Motive Method podcast. The first instance of me completely smashing what I thought my limitations were was in curling. And I've talked and joked a lot about how I used to be a professional curler, which is kind of funny because even at making a grand total of about two or three thousand dollars a year, I was a professional curler. Like that's how much we made being ranked top 20 in the world was two to three thousand dollars a year. So we we're really making it rain there. But I started at a very, very average level. I started curling when I was nine and turned 10 just a few weeks later. For the first few years of me curling, I was spectacularly unimpressive. Nobody would ever have looked at 10-year-old Taryn sliding up and down a curling rink thinking that at one point he would be a world-class curler. I was a lead, so like the lowest position in my first year, and then I moved up to second, and then I think I moved up to third in the third year and then finally up to skip, but that was just what happened in the junior program that I was in. I really wasn't getting that much better. I really wasn't even exceptional in that local junior program. I was just going through the ranks of, oh, well, he's curled for three years, so now he's gonna be a skip. So when I'm 13 and 14 years old, again, still really spectacularly average, but fast forward to just when I was 16 years old, I was on a team that was being groomed to be a Canadian national champion at the Canada Winter Games. When I was 20, I was actually being told by some of the local high performance coaches that they felt that I was the best junior curler in Canada, if not the world. And then fast forward to, as an adult, I went on to skip a team to the finals at the University National Championships. 
I won around a dozen world curling tour events. I won the first ever Manitoba Mixed Doubles Curling Championship. Came within inches of making it to the very largest event in the entire world, the Canadian Briar, which is our Canadian Championship. And I got invited to celebrity curling events where people would raise money to get to curl with me and some of the world's absolute all-time best curlers, which I was not in that ranks, but I was actually going and beating some of those curlers and three times in a row made it to the final. And I was doing all of this, especially as an adult, with curling as sort of a secondary thing. After my junior career, I never really considered curling the main thing that I was doing. I was never super dedicated to it, but even in my 20s and early 30s, while I was treating curling as this secondary thing that I did, essentially it was just a hobby, I was still world class, getting up to the point of being ranked 15th in the world. Now the question is, how do you go from a kid that really has no talent in something to one of the top curlers in the entire world, even without having that natural talent or an insane, unbelievably dedicated work ethic? I've actually talked to a lot of the people that I used to curl with, and one of the reasons why I capped out at 15th ranked team in the world and not 10th or 5th or 1st is because they knew that I actually wasn't that dedicated to it and just treated it as a hobby. So when it came time to talk to teams about stepping up, I just wasn't there because I was treating it so casually. So how do you get from that point of not being tremendously talented to being on a top 20 ranked team in the world with dozens and dozens of wins over the last few years without really even working on it. Well, that's where the system comes into play. And I'll explain what that system was in a second. The next story where I completely smashed my goals that I thought I would ever be able to do was with swimming. When I first took up triathlon, I remember the very first day that I went into the pool and decided I was gonna learn how to swim. I had the goggles, I had the jammers on, I had a thought of going and swimming lengths because I saw these old guys in the pool just swimming back and forth for hours on end. And here I was in my 20s, fit, healthy, totally able-bodied, and it took me an hour to swim 14 lengths. Not even a lap there and back, a length. So we're talking 350 meters in the course of an hour. I went to my office that day and for the entire day I was blowing my nose and blowing chlorine out my nose. It was such a bad experience. I had gone through all of the don't drown level one and don't drown level two swim safety levels as a kid, but I had never really swam laps. So when at 26 or 27, getting that moment of realizing, hey, dude, you basically can't swim and you're registered for a triathlon, really, really big shot to the ego. And that's largely how it continued for again, two years. It was a lot like curling where, yeah, I developed some basic level of proficiency to complete that first triathlon and then a second triathlon, a third triathlon, but I wasn't making any progress. I remember, I think it was my third season in triathlon that I joined a master's swim program. And I tell this story all the time. The master's coach was on deck and he's saying, well, you need a really high elbow recovery and just let that arm just casually dangle. But meanwhile, I was standing there going, I can't breathe in here. What are you talking about? I literally couldn't breathe. I would freak out every swim workout, even though I was swimming two, three times a week. And I had to rely on things like doing an entire workout with a pole boy or fins to be able to actually get through workouts. So this was in 2012 or 13 or so. And then fast forward again, just very shortly after to 2014, I completed a 27 kilometer nonstop open water marathon swim. Fast forward to 2017, I completed the longest open water marathon swim that anyone in our entire province had ever completed of 37 kilometers uh, being about like 23, 24 miles. And in worldwide races, I would be in the top five to 10% of swimmers in the field. So how do I go from that experience of blowing chlorine out my nose to being a world-class amateur triathlon swimmer? Again, it was the system 
of getting from point A to point B that all of you can implement as well. For the third story, let's go to cycling in triathlon because this is probably where I ended up having the most talent. The very first ride that I went on, I went out and I thought that I rode for hundreds of miles. I had bought a bike and it was a road bike and I figured, oh, okay, well, I got really strong legs because I'm a kid and I'm fit and I biked around a lot as a kid. So I must be out here just smashing the bike. Well, again, in an hour, I went, I think it was 13 kilometers. Maybe if I'm being generous, it was 14. And I was smashed, wobbly legs, walking crooked for a few days, completely destroyed. Again, for a couple of years, nothing really improved. I remember after, I think it was my third season in triathlon, I had entered a, a charity bike race. And it was really just a charity bike ride of 140 kilometers. And I sat in behind the leaders the entire day, not taking a pull, not taking a turn, just letting everyone else do the work. And I still had to pull myself out of this charity bike event at 90K. I couldn't complete it. That's how little I had progressed in those years. Now, 90K, like, I can do that standing on my head. I can do that. I've actually done, I think, a 90K tempo workout. Well, yeah, I've done a 90K hard effort in a half Ironman. I think I've done 120K tempo efforts in training for an Ironman. Cycling is probably where I got the fastest. I was able to put out the fifth fastest bike split of, I think, 14 or 1700 athletes at Half Ironman Puerto Rico. I think it was the 12th fastest bike split of the 2000 or 2500 athletes at Half Ironman Atlantic City. In the local twice a week group rides, I would actually occasionally beat former pros in sprints there. That having started with, again, not being able to bike more than 15 kilometers, nine miles in an hour. Again, spectacularly average to being an athlete that I never, never expected that I could be. Running athletically is probably the most significant change. I've told the story a number of times about how I went from being unable to run the length of a house. And then I would walk the length of three houses and then I would run the length of one house. So a hundred feet at a time is what I started with. I really, really couldn't run as a kid. I was the kid that said, well, I'm just not built for running because there were times that I would try to run from school to home, which was eight houses. And it took me weeks and weeks to build up the ability to do that run continuously. Two years after taking up triathlon, I really hadn't made any progress. I was a young person and I was able-bodied, so I was able to get into shape of doing an hour and 53 minute half marathon in the local half marathon, but that was really, really unbelievably painful with cramps and a lot of back pain. And I would slog through the run in every single triathlon that I did. It was terrible. Fast forward a year again, after finding a system, I went down to a 136 half marathon and then a few months later a 132 half marathon and then I went under 20 minutes in a 5k in a 5k road race. I was able to get close to 20 minutes in the running races for the sprint triathlons that I was doing. Running all of a sudden became a strength of mine all the way to the point that the longest race that I did at Challenge Roth, the run was probably my standout performance. I ran 42.2 kilometers with five minute kilometers like clockwork, one after the other after the other without stopping the entire race. Finally, the last story is with YouTube and this podcast, everything that we've done here. I haven't really talked about this a lot, but it's starting to come up as we're talking about our business and the company and people saying, well, how did you get into this position of having this large YouTube channel? Was it a corporate thing? And the answer is no, I, I started literally at nothing. I didn't have connections in the industry. I wasn't super good looking, clearly. Everyone can obviously see that. Maybe people listening in the podcast are actually choosing to listen into the podcast so they don't have to look at my ugly mug. I wasn't a former pro. I wasn't a well-known coach. I didn't leverage collaborations with other influencers. I literally started at zero, zero subscribers and had to grow from there. I had to learn how to edit. I had to learn how to make cuts so that 
I didn't have to do a seven minute video perfectly every single time. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to talk to the camera. I didn't know any of these things. Starting at zero and sticking with really zero results for about 50 or 60 videos where I was the person that went, holy smokes, I got a hundred views on a video. Can you believe it? And then getting to the point where we have the second largest triathlon YouTube channel in the world, the largest triathlon podcast in the world, a total of around four to 500,000 followers combining all of our social media accounts and our email lists and everything like that. I'm really, really proud of that because we literally started at nothing and built it from the ground up. So how did all of this happen? It's not because I'm a natural athlete. I have never had instant success in any athletic endeavor that I've ever taken on. It's not because I got some lucky break and somehow came into some magical coach that taught me how to be a good curler or some unbelievable coach who taught me how to be an endurance athlete and unlocked magical athletic riches that I didn't know would exist. It's not because I found some YouTube consultant that instantly unlocked growth. In every single case, I started being dealt a completely shirt sure. hand that you couldn't work with at all and then ended with a royal flush. And it's not because I have an incredible amount of willpower or this magical gift to progress in things. I lack motivation. I lack natural talent. I have a low VO2 max. I accumulate lactic acid really quickly. My running economy is some of the worst figures that any physiologist has ever seen of any athlete at my level. But I was able to get to these because of the systems that I put in place. And the point of this podcast and video is to say to you that any of you can access these systems. And the system is going to be different for every single task, but how do you take the system of getting better at any task that you want to create and apply it to athletics, to business, to starting a podcast or a YouTube channel or like pseudo athletics being curling. Like how do you just get better at life? And there is a system for that. I'm going to go over to the dry erase board. If you're listening, you're not going to miss a lot, but I'm going to explain the concept of how do you get from no matter where you are starting to wherever you want to be, regardless of what the endeavor is, be it business or athletically or personally or motivationally or whatever it might be. And it's a very simple process. So this diagram here is called the circle of influence. This is from the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from Stephen Covey. This book changed my life when I was about 25, 26. And a big part of the concept of that book is how do you improve yourself? I think it's a very self-helpy kind of name for a book, but it's really a system of how do you get what you want out of life while being happy? And the circle of influence is a big concept in it. So the theory is that let's say this center circle here in the middle, and if you're listening, it's a very small circle of about three inches wide. That's right in the middle of a big circle that is about two and a half feet wide. Now, if the big circle on the outside, these are the representations of your goals, that maybe it's a fitness goal, a really big career goal, a really big financial goal. These are the, this is the target. This is where you want to get out here. But what people miss in a lot of cases that causes a lot of consternation and, and just lack of contentment is all you can really focus on is the center goal. The center goal is your circle of influence. That's what you are able to actually have an effect on. Now, if you try to push and reach and jump from that center goal all the way out to the outer edge, it's too big a jump and you don't have the ability to make that jump right away. What you do have the ability to do is focus on your center circle of influence and try to make it bigger. So the concept of the circle of influence is that instead of focusing directly on the exterior goal as exactly what you are going after right away, you focus instead on pushing out your current circle of influence a little bit. 
And then instantly you can improve your current situation a little bit and you push out and you push out and you just keep pushing out from the center. If you're listening, I'm just gradually making that circle in the middle bigger. And the example that I remember is, let's say you set the goal of, I wanna be president of the United States, but you've never got into politics. Well, you need to first get elected to some maybe school boards, and then you need to get elected to your town council, and then you need to get elected locally and municipally. And then you can gradually push your way out and out. And as you work your way out, the people that you get exposed to will be also people that have bigger circles of influence. And then you will have access to people who have more knowledge and maybe it's coaches. Maybe this is a representation of your current skill level with your athletic abilities and you want to expand it over and over and over, but you only do that by pushing out your current capabilities and your current situation. You don't do it by saying, here's where I'm at, here's where I wanna be, I'm gonna start training exactly for that because the disappointment of not getting there really quickly ends up demotivating a lot of people. So you want to constantly make the goal just pushing out your circle of influence. The more you know. Also, dry erase boards are the best. The thing that I feel that I am exceptional at is that I am obsessive about figuring things out. Somebody actually said to me the other day as I was presenting something for our business where I have created this model that is all done in spreadsheets where what we can put in is like, I explain them as dials, where if we turn this dial, more signups happen. If we turn this dial, more signups happen. If we turn another dial another way, less signups happen. And as we turn all the dials, we can see how the app could possibly grow and be a significant thing in the industry. And the person said, well, how did you learn to do this? And I went, I don't know, I just, I did it. And I thought about it for a second and I went, well, I've literally always been obsessed with figuring things out. I've always been obsessed with figuring out the system of how to get from where I'm at now to a better level, to a bigger level, to a faster level, to more subscribers, to a better curler, whatever it might be. I've been obsessed with figuring out the parts of how do you progress in something. And as I look back at why I think we were successful in growing our YouTube channel, it's the same reason that we were successful in curling and the same reason I was successful in triathlon and each endeavor in triathlon, not just improving in one and getting faster because we got faster in one, but improving as a swimmer, improving as a cyclist and improving as a runner. With each of those five stories, I did pretty much exactly the same thing, but it was a different thing that allowed me to progress. In curling, I needed to slide at a straight line directly at a broom that was on the other side of the sheet. So I thought, I have a hard time sliding in a straight line. How do I learn how to slide in a straight line? So I figured out in curling that if I had to slide, slide through a straight line, I would teach myself and force myself how to learn how to slide through that straight line. So I started with setting up two rocks that were about 16 inches apart from each other, about six feet in front of the hack. The hack is the thing that you push off from. Just Google curling and you'll see what I mean. So I would set up those rocks and I would have a rock in my hand and I would push off and I would try to slide through those two rocks with my rock. And there would be about an inch on either side of the rock. And if I could get the rock and my foot and then the rear foot that was trailing all through that one rock, I would slide straight. So I learned how to do that. And then I added another set of rocks about four feet further. So I had to get through one set of rocks and then another set of rocks with my rock, my foot, and then the trail foot. And then I eventually built up to having four sets of rocks in the entire length of a slide where I would slide through over and over throwing rocks, knowing that my rock was straight, my foot was directly in behind the rock, and my trailing foot was directly in behind the rock. And people around the club would actually point it out and go, hey, look at that kid over there. He's gonna go and slide through those rocks. And I could overhear people going, come on, get serious. That can't happen. Because I had, 
a half an inch or an inch on either side of my rock and doing that over and over and over 50 to 100 times every single day for six months, boom. I went from a very average curler to instantly picked up by a junior team that was starting to be groomed to go to the Canada Games. Swimming, I had had all of those difficulties and still didn't know how to breathe. So I started from scratch and went down to the absolute basics of putting my feet on the floor of the pool, putting my hands on the side of the wall, putting my face in the water and blowing bubbles. And then I would blow bubbles and then I would kick my feet up the, off the bottom of the floor and continue to blow bubbles. And then I would continue to do that, but then turn to the side and try to grab a little breath of air. Then I would try to kick my feet off the floor and just gradually flutter kick my feet to stop myself from sinking. I developed this process that is now outlined in triathlon swimming foundations that literally builds the comfort and capability of being able to breathe in the water and not sink. Right from there, boom, instantly, I could do a 2000 meter workout, a 3000 meter workout, build up from that 3000 meter workout to the 27K open water swim just 18 to 24 months later because I had built the basics and started with where am I at and where do I wanna be and how do I create a process? Cycling, I looked at what I was struggling with. I was struggling with my legs giving in because they weren't able to have the endurance and I wanted to be faster. So every single week I did a low intensity, longer and longer bike ride and then a very intense ride. This is the two bike workouts per week system that was outlined in Triathlon Bike Foundations. Again, I looked at what am I struggling with? How do I improve the things that I'm struggling with to just get better? I didn't say, I'm a bad cyclist, but I want to be top 10. Okay, I'm just going to go train the house down. I looked at where am I starting from and how do I just improve on my current capabilities. With running, what I had to learn was what is stopping me and what stops the average person from being able to run really quickly? Well, it just feels like I'm running through mud. It feels like I'm working really hard, but I'm not really going that fast. How is everyone else out there when they go fast able to push really fast and have really quick foot turnover? And then I realized my legs haven't really moved fast in like 20 years since I was a kid and had to run in gym class. What if I started doing wind sprints just to unlock the neuromuscular capability of going really fast. Boom, instantly within a few months, that took me from the 153 half marathon to the 132 half marathon. And then with YouTube, what happened was I had done 50, 60, 70 videos without a whole lot of hoopla about it, not really one successful video, but what I saw as I was typing in autocompletes for the Ironman World Championship, I wanted to view the Ironman World Championship previous videos and I saw that it was 2015 or 14 thereabouts and I saw that people were starting to search for that year's upcoming World Championship and I went huh okay people are searching for this year's upcoming and there are no videos for it what if I did a preview video boom that video got I think 25,000 views and I went oh okay, I need to create content that people are searching for that there aren't many, if any, videos for. And instantly, I will start being the video that people go to because nobody else has made those videos. I wasn't looking at what are the big Casey Neistats of the world doing that I should do. I looked at, okay, what can I do that is going to get me more views right now within my current capabilities? So what I didn't do was I didn't really ever focus on the outcome. In a lot of cases, people will say to me, well, who do you look up to as a business person or what is your goal? And I tend to answer that with, I don't really look up to anyone. I look up to a better version of myself. I seek to be a better version of myself. I seek to be better in a month with what I am focused on than I was six months ago. In the case of the app, it's okay, what are the things that we have to improve right now? It's number one request that we get from our athletes is being able to send their run workouts from the app to their Garmin. So they can just load the workout on their Garmin and it guides them through the workout. So what have I been doing for the last 10 days? I've been programming 
the structured run files to go to the Garmin watches. And within the next few weeks, we're going to have that. And just picking off, okay, how do we improve things every little bit instead of saying, well, Nick Bear does this and I'm starting at zero, I'm gonna go do what Nick Bear does. Instead of looking at pros or fitness influencers or people that are so far down the path that knowing what they're doing is really not whatsoever relevant to what I'm doing, I have just focused on what am I doing now that is going to make me a better version of me. And that's what I would encourage all of you to do. Whether it's athletically or business-wise or spiritually or emotionally or whatever it is, look at where the chinks in the armor are right now and where can you improve on that. So maybe it is a better system for learning how to swim or bike or run or signing up for our training app to follow a system and a program. I think why we've been successful in YouTube in particular is A, we had a system for choosing what videos to do, and B, we actually gave people systems, be it the two bikes per week, the how to unlock some running speed and learn how to run when you're just learning how to run, or how to learn how to breathe. We gave those systems so that people could focus on where they're at right now and where they want to be. So I would really encourage you to just take an assessment of where you're at, set a crazy, unbelievable goal that you don't think you could possibly do ever in your life, but set little breadcrumb goals along the way and trust that if you are checking off those goals along the way and you are focusing on improving yourself to get to each one of those incremental goals, that you are going to eventually get to your goal. I wouldn't focus on the very end goal because you're working outside of your circle of influence at that point. You're not gonna be doing very good training, you're not gonna make very good decisions because you're gonna be making decisions about things that you can't really influence. This gets to the point of relative to endurance training, where you should set your training. I once had somebody who was about a five hour, 10 minute, half Ironman and said he wanted to be a world champion. I said, that, that's great. We don't know if you can be a world champion, but we might be able to get there. He said, well, I need training that sets me up to be a world champion. I said, well, I don't really know how that training is any different than here's the paces that you can hold right now. Here are the power numbers that you can hold right now. Here are the swim drills that you need to work on right now. And we have to train around those physiological limitations that you currently have. And can you get to be a world champion? Maybe. If your body accepts and receives that training and gets a little better and then your power and pace numbers all improve and then you do it again and again and again and again, that's how you become a world champion and hopefully your body just keeps accepting the training but there comes a point where everyone's physiology just tapers off and where that is for everyone, we don't know. You can't will yourself to have the physiology that you want, you only have the physiology that you have. So you have to focus on the current athlete that you are and build your training around that. And that is how you become a much better athlete. Because if you build your training around an athlete that you currently aren't, and then try to train for that, your body isn't going to be able to handle that training load. You're going to get sick. You're going to get injured. You're not even really going to get any faster than if you just trained at your current level because all you need to do is train a little bit faster than your current level to actually see improvement. And going any further beyond that is just suffering for the sake of suffering. And it's more likely that you're going to get injured than you're going to get faster. So how do we get from where you're at now to the really big goal? And I wanna simplify the process for you. Number one is to have that really big goal because that really big goal does motivate you to go through all the little steps and keeps pushing you. Number two is to, instead of focusing on that goal and working your way back, start at where you're at right now and working your way forward. Think about how you can make small little incremental improvements every single day that is going to get you further and further away from who you were and closer to who you want to be. The third thing is to set small little breadcrumb goals along the way. And hopefully each of those little breadcrumb goals scares you a little bit. I like to use the rule of thumb that 
no matter what your next goal is, make it something that if you had to do it tomorrow, you would have a 50-50 shot at doing it. So maybe my goal that scares the hell out of me is to run a 100 mile race. But I know that to run a 100 mile race, I need to be able to run 25 miles and not feel so terrible. And I know that if I did that tomorrow, I could probably do it, but I also might get injured. Like literally, I'm just thinking about this right now. That is really interesting because if I set a 25 mile goal now, six weeks from now, I'm pretty likely to hit it, but I'm gonna be very motivated to do it because I know that the certainty isn't 100%. And is going through that process of running for the 25 mile goal in six weeks going to get me closer to the 100 mile goal? 100%. The fourth thing that I encourage you to consider is to set not just one goal, but set A, B, C goals. I actually learned this from Lauren Kelba, who is on our podcast, that if all you have is one single goal that is make or break, you're setting yourself up for actual mental pain. If you end up reaching it, it's a celebration, but it's a minor celebration because that's what everything was based around and it's just checking the box of, yep, checked off the goal. But if you set an A goal that is pretty crazy that you aren't sure if you're going to be able to do it, but then a B goal that you think is quite likely that you can do, but things have to go well to actually achieve it. And then a C goal of, well, this is one that I'm pretty certain that I can do, but I still have to be fairly diligent to do, then you're almost guaranteed to win. This is really important for mental health and athletic motivation, is making sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation where there's a high likelihood of not reaching goals, because not reaching goals and injuries are the two most common reasons that athletes have a two times higher incidence rate of mental health issues than the average population. It's because they're just quite often let down and injured. So if we can avoid injury and we can make sure that, hey, maybe you didn't get your A goal, but you got your B goal, or maybe you didn't get those and things really went off the rails, but you still stayed diligent enough to get your C goal, take pride in reaching that C goal. And that is going to give you the latitude to every single time you have a goal, be excited about it and reach those goals. So motivators, I hope that this helps you understand how to mentally think about getting to a goal that you want to achieve. Yes, it is setting something that's big and crazy, but it is focusing on the circle of influence that you can control and ticking off those things that you can accomplish every single day that get you to that crazy goal. And I guarantee that if you do little bits of improvements every single day, you're not going to be able to reach a goal that you think is out of reach. You're gonna be able to smash that goal and completely eclipse the individual or the athlete that you think is possibly capable of you actually achieving. You're going to leapfrog that almost certainly if you stay diligent and you stay regular. Hopefully you found this helpful. If you did, I'd love if you shared it with somebody. And if you want a system for how to train and check off little bits of work every single day that I know is going to get you to any endurance goal that you want, I'd love if you checked out our Motive Training app. All you have to do is put in the dates that you wanna race and how much that you wanna race, and all of the training is done for you. What we say is that it's as good as a one-on-one -on -one coach, but as cheap as doing it yourself. So if that interests you, go check it out for free for 14 days at mymotive.com. And if you found this helpful, share it with a friend to help get them controlling their circle of influence. With all of that said, thank you for watching. Later, motivators.